the Facebook the Facebook uh, family today. Welcome to the service today at Riverside Bible Church. We're glad that you're tuning in with us from wherever you might be. We appreciate it, and I hope it'll be a blessing to you, and I hope that you will uh, just join right in, and uh, and may the Lord bless you greatly today. We're in Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3, and we're going to read uh, a few verses. We'll start with uh, verse 7, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw all my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you of an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you harden through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, Howbeit not all came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could enter, they could not enter in because of unbelief. This morning had been uh, the last Sunday before Thanksgiving. I'm preaching on the subject Thanksgiving, past, present, and future. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for what it has to say, how it speaks to our heart, how it touches us, how it changes us, if we'll let it. Lord, let us have open minds today. Let our hearts be open, that we may be followers of you, that we may be listening to the Spirit today. Lord, meet with us, Lord. We can't have church without you, but you promised we're two or three would gather together and you would be in our midst. And Lord, we believe that today, and we're trusting that today. Now speak to us through your word, and we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. This portion is sponsored by Big Gulf from 7 Eleven. <laughs> I have to throw that in every once in a while for a good book from 7 Eleven. All right. How thankful are we at Thanksgiving? We should be thankful people, especially if you're a child of God. We have a lot to be thankful for. But I think we forget about the things that, that God has blessed us with from time to time. And listen, it's a great thing for a child of God in your walk with God to remind yourself of the things God has blessed you with and done for you. Go back and take a look. You know when David, uh, King David, was uh, had been out to battle with the enemy because his own people wouldn't accept him at the time. And when they had come back to camp, another enemy had come in and taken all of their possessions and had taken all their family. And everybody was so worked up about it that even the men that David was with wanted to pick up stones and stone David to death as the leader of this group. So David went off and began to talk with the Lord about what had happened. And the Bible says this, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. What do you think David had that he could go back and look in his, in his past and come up and realize that God had blessed him in some great ways? Do you think he could remember back when he was just a shepherd boy? Watching his father's sheep and, and how a bear tried to come and steal a sheep and, and he slew that bear. And, and a lion came to try and do the same thing and he did that. You think he could think back to the time that he went out and stood before a giant of a man called Goliath of the Philistines. And how God took him down with a sling and a stone. And how they defeated the Philistines on that day. And how David then became a great warrior for God. You think he began to encourage himself when he thought about how good God is 
and how he blesses in some of the most worst of circumstances, God comes through. Because it isn't about what God can and cannot do. It's about how obedient we are and how much we believe he can or cannot do. God's hand isn't shortened that he can't do anything. It's our, our faith that gets shortened. He's, Jesus said, it's, it, all things are possible to those who believe. He was going to heal a man's daughter. And before he could get there, they come and said, your daughter's dead, don't trouble the master anymore. And so the man said, looks at Jesus and he says, is there anything that you can do? And he says, it's not that is there anything I can do. Do you believe there's anything that I can do? They go, all things are possible for those who believe. See, that's the kind of God we serve. Now, we're going to talk about past, present, and future Thanksgiving. Because, do you have a past? We all have a past. Do you have things in your past that you're not proud of? Do you have things of your past that you wish was not there in your past? We do a lot of things about the past and the things that we've run across in our lives. We try and, and we try and live it down. We try and, and, and rise above it. We try and act like maybe it didn't happen, but we know it did. And, or we try and run from it. Do you think the great men and women of the Bible have past? We all have a past, folks. So you, when David sat out and began to encourage himself in the Lord, do you think he went back and thought about the time that he had sinned with Bathsheba and had Uriah the Hittite killed and all of that and lost the baby and all the turmoil that was in his home? Do you think he went back and thought about those things? Not at this point. But you don't, don't think that that did not haunt David over his life. Just like it haunts you and I. We can't run from it. We can't live it down. It's always in our minds and it always comes back at certain times to remind us of things. But listen, I'm not bound by my past mistakes that are under the blood of Jesus. You think the Apostle Paul had a past? Oh my goodness. Would he be your choice to be a leader of a church? <laughs> no, he would not. He wreaked havoc on the church. He persecuted the church. I often wonder if the thorn in his flesh wasn't the memory of those he had tortured. When it was lost. Lord can you not just. Take these thoughts away. And take these memories away. Because you know when he started working for the Lord. And started serving God. I wonder if there weren't times. That he came up on some family. That he had had their husband. Or their children. Uh, put in jail and tortured. And maybe even killed. I wonder. If that wasn't torture. For the apostle Paul. But yet, when you look at the Apostle Paul, who God used to pen most of the New Testament. Seriously? What's your past look like? Are you looking back over your past and you're looking at those things and, and they're, they're raising their ugly head from time to time and it holds you back from doing things for God? Listen, if you have gotten to went to the Lord and asked for forgiveness, you do not have to be bound by that past. The past is the past. Listen, so guess what? I give thanks to God that I am not what I used to be. Man, because when I look at the no-count person that I was before I met Jesus Christ, Man, I tell you, it can run me in the ground. And there's times in my life when those memories rise to the forefront. Maybe a song that, that comes over the radio. Or maybe something that someone said. Or maybe I go home and run into a past person that I used to run with. And all of those things come rushing back. And I almost feel condemnation all over again. But I have to say, God, I am thankful that you saved me from this. 
That you washed my sins under your blood, and I am not bound by that. So now I say thank you, God, for my past, that it's not that, it's this. You have done something tremendous in my life. When we talk about thanking God, you know, we stand around with our families at Thanksgiving, and maybe we hold hands and go around the table and say, what are you thankful for? Oh, I'm thankful for the turkey. <laughs> I'm thankful for my family around the table. I'm thankful for my job. I'm thankful. Listen, folks, we've got so much more than just that to be thankful. What if Jesus, praying in the garden of Gethsemane, said, Lord, these people aren't going to appreciate this. There are going to be some that are going to mock this and make fun of this, and there's going to be plenty that are not even going to accept it, and they're going to spend an eternity in hell. What is the reason? Why don't you just come get me? Let's start it all over. He could have. He could have, and he could have been justified in doing it. He gave in to the Father's will and said, not my will, but thy will be done. This is the only way this can happen, and this must happen. Are you not thankful for that? You gather with your family this Thanksgiving. Whoever comes over to your house and gathers around, don't forget to say I'm thankful for Jesus. Amelia's song, I'm thankful that he took me out of the darkness and brought me into the light. I'm thankful that he took me and he washed me and he made me white as snow. Amelia, there's your cover right on the <laughs> I'm thankful for the cross and what Jesus has done for me. He took away my past. Do I have to live with some of the consequences of my past? Absolutely. It's part of life. I cannot shirk my responsibilities of the things and my, the consequences of the actions that I took in my early days, in my younger days, and my even, we'll talk about the present here in a moment, but in my past, I cannot shirk those responsibilities. That's why people today say, if there's really a God, why doesn't he just straighten everything out? Why do we have children that are starving? Why do we have people that are drug ridden? And why do we have people living on the streets? Why don't God just do something? He did do something. It's you and I not wanting to take responsibility of our own sin. Sin has brought these things about in this world. Not God. He created a place that was perfect. We messed it up. Where's our responsibility? So I take responsibility of my actions. And the consequences of what happened in the past. But listen, I am not bound by that because it has been forgiven by God. And I'm thankful for that. Listen, that's the hope of every one of us today. That I do not stand before God one day of judgment and give one single answer for the past that's under the blood. I'll give an account of what I've done since I've been a Christian. That has to do with rewards. Because I know Jesus is a Savior. That's my entrance into glory. Don't get hung up on works. I, I believe your life should show by the life that you live, the things that you do, show that you're a child of God. But I'm not a child of God by my works. By my faith in what Christ has done for me. All right. So, Paul had a past. Peter had a past. Abraham had a past. David had a past. You got a past. This Thanksgiving, I'm going to thank God 
that I'm not what I used to be and that he's changed me and that I'm thankful for that. I could still be there. Listen, I'll tell you what I'm thankful for. I'm thankful at 12 years old God didn't allow me to die when I was playing around with that gun that day. I could be dead and in hell with it. But God had mercy on me and I'm thankful for that even though I didn't get saved till five years later. But the Lord was already working on me. We don't know what God has for us to do in life. But he's working on it. The children of Israel as the writer of Hebrews is reminding the Hebrews that in times past, your fathers, in their unbelief, refused to believe that God could do all the things that God said he could do. He took them out of Egypt. He brought them across the, the dry ground of the Red Sea. He took them into the Promised Land, and he marched them to the edge, conquering those ahead of them. And as they got to the promised land, the land of Canaan, that he promised Abraham all that time, way back, he was ready to fulfill it. But because of their unbelief, they wandered 40 more years in the wilderness and died in the wilderness, not being able to take the promise of God. Gave. Don't be them. Don't be what's in the past. The only way to properly deal with the past is to learn from it. What mistakes did I make that I don't want to make now? What mistakes happened that God can help me prevent to go back and fall into that stuff over and over and over and over again? Are you still falling into the same things over and over and over and over? You are your father's son, but you do not need to repeat your father's sins. You know how many children today say, well, I was good enough for my dad. Well, what? If it's sinful and wrong, you might be your father's son, but you don't have to carry your father's sins. Get it forgiven. Move on. Be what God wants you to be. Don't just repeat, repeat, repeat. Doesn't that happen? You have an alcoholic father, an alcoholic mother, and you turn into an alcoholic. Have you lived that? It happens. Drug addict parents, and then the kids become drug addicts. It doesn't have to happen that way. That's not just life. That's not just something that happens. It's not hereditary. I may be born in this world through them, but I do not have to carry their sins and repeat it all over. And neither do you. But I can learn. I can learn from those things. There's a song that uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the guy's name. Country singer, I can't think right now, but the song tells a story about a little girl whose mom and dad were bad. And they fought and they drank. He'd beat the mother and she would hide behind the couch. And she was hiding behind that couch one day. Montgomery. What, what's the country singer? John Michael Montgomery. Uh, he's the one who sings this song. It tears me up every time I hear it. The little girl was hiding behind the couch and witnessed her dad killing her mom and then killing himself. And when they came and then they took her and they put her in, in, in with another family and this family went to church and when they went to church and she was sitting in Sunday school, she was sitting there and she was staring 
and a picture of Jesus on the cross. And they asked her, what, what are you looking at there? And she says, well, you know what? She says, I don't, uh, she says, I don't know what his name is, but I know that he got down from that cross. Because the night my mom and dad died, he was with me behind the couch. Listen, I don't have to live tore down, ripped up by my past. I can learn from it and move forward with the help of Christ. Now, whether that was a true story or not, it seems to me like I remember saying something that was written by, by somebody uh, based on a true story. But whether it was or wasn't, I'm afraid that is a circumstance that happens a lot in life. But these kids, listen, they can be different than that and better than that when they find Jesus as their Savior. And you can. So, are you thankful for what Jesus has done in the past? Are you thankful that you're not what you used to be? Number two, how about the present? The here and now. The here and now is about conviction, conduct, believing, behaving in response to God's call, what is his call to you today? Is it Christianity? I believe it is. I believe that's the call for every one of us. God intends for everyone ever born into this world to be saved. No question about it. I don't care where they come from, where they live, what they've done, what they what they raised into, or any of that. God still intends for them to find Him as Savior and be saved. God so loved the world, not the United States of America, not just one part of the world, but He loved the world. Old things are passed away. Christianity. What is that? Listen, what is God convicting you about? What is God conducting in your life right now? What are you believing right now? How are you behaving to the call of God to Christianity? What kind of life are you living? Are you right living? Are you giving of service to Him? Are you living a life that is pleasing to Him? Are you? Then we should show thanks. How thankful are we? God is not, He's, he's, he's concerned about more than just what we've done for Him. What about what have you done for him lately? Today, if you hear his voice, heart not your heart. What have you given into lately? What have you heard from God lately? Then what did you do? God brings something to your mind. God brings something to your heart. Amelia said she had to go back to that song several times. God just kept bringing her back, bringing her back, bringing her back. She could have said, nah, I don't, I don't even know that song. So, yeah, I just heard something. How are, much are we really listening? And how are we responding today? So, well, yesterday, I, that's great. That's great. But yesterday is over. What, what am I doing? Listen, this is how the Christian walks, by the way. If you've been listening to our Wednesday night messages, and you've been here for Wednesday night messages, and if you haven't, you should. We've been talking about how you walk as a Christian. 
your daily walk, how we live, how we move forward. This is it, folks. I don't simply say, well, it was a great day yesterday, and the Lord was so good, and we communed together, and it was, we had a great time, and then skip today. Because I'm tired, or I'm weak, or, or I just don't want to give the effort. I need to be asking God to help me be strong. Help me be vigilant. And help me realize it's well worth the effort. You know, as I was getting ready to uh, to clean the drive off this morning and get ready to come to church, and man, we probably got, I don't know, six, seven, eight inches at our house. It was a lot of snow. Uh, it was up here. And uh, by the time I'm out there plowing it off, and I'm looking out, and, and everybody's cleaning off drives, and I get out, and we drive, and of course, we've got to make our 7 Eleven stop. Place is packed. No, everybody's just doing the same thing. That snow just slows them down one bit. Nothing's going to stop them from getting that cup of coffee at the 7-Eleven or that donut or that Diet Coke, right? Nothing's going to stop them from that. They got their routines. They got their things they're going to do, and they're going to do it no matter what. All of that's worth the effort, but God is not worth the effort. Listen, if I want to clean my car off and clean my driveway off and go to the 7-Eleven and get a cup of coffee, I'm coming to church. It's well worth the effort. Listen, your walk with God is every single day you wake. What are you doing for God today? This is a great start. Being in the house of God, to worship the Lord together, and to lift our voices up and sing, and to, and to share the message, and, and the things, and the testimonies, and, and the work that goes on, and the things in this church. Listen, I hope that every Sunday that you come to this house of worship, that you leave feeling like it was well worth the effort to come and worship God with His people. Behold, Psalm 133. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious ointment poured on the head, dripping down into the beard, even Aaron's beard. It's like the dew that you can see on Mount Hermon. There are the blessings of life evermore. Anointing the head of Aaron as a priest, and as that oil ran down into his beard, it was something special, spiritual, as God was anointing his man to lead his people. That's how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. In unity. That's why when we come here to this place, as long as God gives me breath and as long as you allow me to come and be your pastor at this church, we're just going to have church. Amen. We'll figure all the other stuff out. All right? We need to scrape that down and paint. We need to get our gutters clean, and we're working on that. We need to get our sound system right so all these uh, messages go out to the to whoever wants to hear them. We need to get all this stuff done, but I'm going to tell you something. I'm not going to come in on Sunday morning and argue and fight about who's going to do it and how it's going to get done and when it's going to be. Oh, no. Today, in this place, we're going to worship. Got nothing else on my mind. All that stuff to take care of itself. Listen, I don't let the house of God fall down. It's our responsibility to take care of what God has blessed us with, and we should do all that we can to make that happen. But when we come in here on Sunday morning, it don't matter what color the carpet is. And it don't matter that we've got eight inches of snow on the ground. What matters is when we come in this place together, united to worship. I'm not 
not afraid. And I hope God always helps me recognize things and cut things off of the past. Listen, God, if God has called me to shepherd this sheep, I'm thankful for that. I was a little worried today about how many might show up. And the Lord said, all the sheep that come to the barn, feed them. <laughs> okay, all right. I'm glad you're all okay. But there are times when the enemy will try and slip in the door. And we got to be aware of that. Now listen, I'd be glad to have a conversation with you at some time about my feelings about speaking in tongues. And I have a lot of Pentecostal friends, and some of them are watching my Facebook this morning. Good morning. They know how I feel. I know how they listen. They share with me how they feel. I still don't understand it, even though they share it. But I'm going to tell you something. There's the scripture is what I go by. I don't go by what my friends say. Not I don't want them to go by what I say. I say there's an order. The scripture gives an order. So if we're here at church and we're having church and somebody jumps up and starts speaking in a language out of something that I don't understand, the first thing I'm going to do is say, hold it. Is there an interpreter present? No? No interpreter? Please sit down. That's not a God. Just a bunch of words that no one understands, not even them. How is that going to bless anyone? Let's just follow the order. No more than two or three in any given service, and each must have an interpreter. And if not, they should sit down and be quiet. Now, if they said, somebody jumped up over here and said, yes, I know exactly what they're saying. I go, speak on. <laughs> I'm not afraid of it. I'm not against it. I'm just saying, we got to follow the scriptural order. I'm not afraid of that. I'm not afraid to do that. You know, I was in a church one time, and this lady knew that we didn't speak in tongues in that way, and especially without an interpreter. And every time I asked for testimonies, she wanted to stand up and testify how she spoke in tongues in a place. And I asked her every time, was there an interpreter present? She said no. I go, what was you saying? Could you interpret? No. I said, then what did you get from it? <clears throat> Finally, I had to every time we give ask for testimonies, and she stood up. I said, "If you're going to testify of speaking in tongues, you can be seated right now." Listen, folks, we've got to have a shepherd that watches over the flock. We just went through that with this false missionary thing, right? We got to watch that the devil doesn't climb in. Over some of the way. He, if he tries to come through the door, he'll be rejected. But if he tries to climb in some of the way, like acting like a spiritual person, if it's not biblical, stop it. Amen. Is it worth the effort today? It is for me to today. When I wake up in the morning, I got routines too. If I, listen, if I don't follow the routine of brushing my teeth, get my medicine out, what little I take, I'll forget. If anything goes wrong, if something woke me up and I had to get up early and, and had to run out and do something, I don't forget all about that. I'll end up not taking my medicine today. I'll end up not doing this today or that today. Listen, it's a routine. I, it's all right. Routines are okay. But whether I jump up because I had to get up and rush out, or whether I get up with the same routine, it never goes without God. Amen. If I'm running out the door because something happened, I'm on my mind already saying, God, help me, help this person, help this situation. Lord, already take charge of what's going on. Not me take charge. I need if I can be a tool to help, I'll help but God. It's going to take something much greater than me to make things happen, to change things, to make things good. 
right? And why would I want to walk out of my house without the Lord? That's every day, folks. That's how we live. Christianity is not a way of life. It is your life. It's not a jacket that you try on and see how it fits. You go, oh, this Christianity seems pretty good. Man, I like what's going on at that church. They are, they're fired up down there. Let me, let me put some of that on. Woo, that feels good. Yeah, yeah. Amen, brother. Preach it. Sing the songs. Give the offering way. Do all the things that everybody else is doing. And then when church is over. Oh, I can't, I can't go home like this. I, what, what, would my, what would my family think? What would my kids think? I can't go to work like this. What would my co-workers say? Oh, no, no, no. no. I, I, let, let me get that off. Ooh, that is hot. Woo. Let me lay it over here. I'll pick that up next Sunday. This is what Christianity is not. It's not just a way of life. It is your life. It's what you become when you accept Christ. You become a child of God. Old things are passed away. All things become new. And now i got a new walk and a new life in Christ Jesus. And I'm not the same. I've been bought with a price. I belong to him. Who died on the cross for me. Every day. Every day. God continually confronts us with some moment of truth to which we must respond. And in our response, we demonstrate our faithfulness to Him. So listen, you came here today, maybe for the right reasons and maybe for the wrong reasons. I don't know, because I don't know your heart. Thank God. I don't want to know what you're thinking right now. I don't want to know how many's thinking about the NFL this afternoon. I don't want to know who's thinking about the roast that's cooking in the crock pot. I don't want to know who's got their mind on something else than worshiping and listening to what God has to say today, asking God to speak to our hearts so that I can respond properly today. When's the last time you responded to what God had to say to you. Hmm. You know that the Lord just gave me that question, but that's interesting, isn't it? I come here with hopes and prayers ahead of time. That the message God gives me is for me, first of all, for you to either do a challenge, something you say amen and thankful for, something that encourages you, something that convicts you, and then when we give an invitation, we respond to what God has spoken to us. Listen, when, there's a lot of times uh, when, when I wasn't doing the preaching that I'd go to the altar and just pray saying, thank you, Lord, for the message today. Help me to live it. You know, everybody, everybody doesn't think that they do. They should be here at the altar themselves. That if you step out and come to an altar to pray, that they automatically think you've got some kind of bad sin in your life that you need to take care of. Maybe you do, but it's none of their business. That's between you and God. But what kind of attitude is that? If they do have sin in their life that needs to be taken care of, isn't that a great place to go? And right here in the church and let everybody come and gather around them and pray? If they have needs... You know, the older I get, the more I enjoy being old-fashioned. <laughs> My dad, you were right. Mom, they're turning over their grave right now. Going, man, I can't believe he said that. I 
I miss my parents. But I want to say this. We need to be ready to respond to God today. You know what? I, I got no guarantee of tomorrow. There's not a single one of you in this building that knows you're going to be here tomorrow. So if today, if somehow you knew that today was your last day on this earth, what would you do today? Would you say, preacher, stop right where you are. Back it up, I need to hear it all over again. I didn't get it the first time, but now that I know that I'm, I'm not going to be here tomorrow, I need to give it a word. <laughs> what would you do differently? When I respond to God, I show Him that I believe in Him. That if He brings something to my heart and my mind that I need to do, I simply trust him. And I give myself to that. And listen, it isn't easy. Because sometimes it's things that I've had in my life a long time that have to be broken and changed and moved and switched and, and made better. And listen, we don't like that. Aren't we creatures of comfort? Don't we like our comfort zone? Don't we like that there's certain things that we do that we really enjoy and sometimes we just can't do it? I'm glad that I'm 65 and, they, and the University of Tennessee has not asked me to play football for them. <laughs> Because I think I played that game just a little differently last night. You guys should feel sorry for me. I'm in sad shape today. I don't even know how I can preach. <laughs> There's lots of things in life that I enjoy doing. Even listening to my beloved volunteers. Play lousy. But I'm not going to sit and listen to that if there's something else that God has for me to do. I'm not going to do it in place of my Bible study or my prayer time or my study time or anything else. Listen, I love the golf. I don't know how I've fallen in love with that game. You know, as they say, you know, chasing that little white ball all around the countryside. But listen, I get my money's worth. I get 300 yards that way, 300 yards that way, 300 <laughs> yards that way. But I enjoy that. So when a buddy calls up and says, hey, want to play some golf today? I go, I can't do it today. Because I already had things that God intended for me to get done. And I cannot set it aside simply because of something that even that I enjoy. How many times do we set God aside to go do other things? Only you can answer that. But I tell you, it's something that I have fought against in the past, and it does get easier as you go along, as you trust God. I get plenty of opportunities to play golf, folks. I get plenty of opportunities to do things that I love. I get plenty of opportunities. Linda was saying the other day that uh, uh, she, she, she'd get up and do things. She, she was trying to recover from the sickness she had. She's doing much better now. But she would say, I'd go for a little couple hours, and then i got to lay down and take a nap. And then I'd get up and go up and lay down and take a nap. I said, that's not like a perfect life for me. <laughs> you know, I don't know. We probably get that nap in. But listen, I'm going to get it in. you got it. You guys are so good to me because you just about let me say anything. Well, I'm just going to take advantage of it, all right? I'm not going to let the easy chair keep me from Wednesday night service. Okay.
Kind of like the guy that was, uh, <laughs> oh, was at a revival and he was sitting in front of me. And I thought he was having a heart attack because the preacher was preaching that hard and heavy. And I came here and go, oh, and I was like, man, this guy's going to drop it in the ball. So I leaned up in my seat. I was sitting behind him and I leaned up. And I kept, I, then I could hear what he was saying. Here's what he said. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you. Man, God was hitting him right between the eyes. And he was taking it all in and thanking God for every bit of it. Man, did that speak to me. <coughs> you guys have heard me say this before. We got some new people in here today, so I'll say it again. The preacher's in the service and the, he's preaching and he noticed back about no way back this lady. She's every time he's preaching on a hit a good point, she goes. Swings her head back. He goes, what is going on with this lady? And she did it the whole service. When the service was over, he met her at the door. And he said, ma'am, are you all right? She goes, oh, yeah, that was a great service today, preacher. He says, well, well, you kept jerking your head. She goes, oh, yeah, because as you give it to me, I pass it back. Thank you. <laughs> I don't want to be that guy. Or that guy. I want to be the, oh, thank you. <laughs> Past, present. How about future? Nothing is more really basic in biblical Christianity than what our hopes are for hereafter. Aren't you glad that this is not all there is? Mm -hmm. I am. The second coming of Christ. Heaven, hell, punishment, reward, all of these are major facets of faith. Faith that proclaims, this world is not my home. This is not eternity. This is not where I'll spend eternity. Neither will you. And there's only two places to go when you die. You're either going to go to a place of rest, which is heaven, or you're going to go to hell. One of the two is where you're going to end up when you breathe your life in this world. That's because this world is not our home. And our faith believes that Christ is preparing a place for his children, for those that know him and love him. And when that place is prepared and done, God is going to tell him to come get us. Bless you. He could send Abraham to come get us. He could send Elijah. Hey, he's had time on a chariot of fire and horses, right? That's the way he left. He could come back, swoop back in and get us all and say, follow me. No. No. Jesus is going to come and get us. We that are saved, the dead in Christ shall rise first. I, I won't go there. The dead in Christ will rise first. You know, they say all of, all of the Christians that fall asleep on Sunday morning, if you lay them end to end in the pew, they sleep more comfortably. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet who? The Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, let me tell you something. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and that happened at this very moment, you would be left sitting on this pew. Mm -hmm. Do you want to know how you are forever with the Lord? You're ready for that to come and you know Jesus is your Savior and the Lord comes with a shout. I wonder what the shout is. If God can hear and answer prayer all over the world at the same time. I, and, and listen, this is just me thinking, alright? So don't run home and 
to say the Bible says this. This is me thinking. Wouldn't it be wonderful if at the same time all over the world, the church, each member heard their name? When Jesus at the, at the tomb of Lazarus, what did he call out? Come forth! If he had him, every dead person in that graveyard would have stepped out. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Maybe we'll hear our name. Maybe our heavenly, maybe whatever name he has, we'll hear it and we'll know it and we'll respond to it. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Not today, preacher. Not today, God. Twinkling of an eye. That quick, folks. That quick. And listen, it takes no rocket scientist to figure it out the signs of the times today. You can see it all around us. We better be getting ourselves ready. You need to pack your spiritual suitcase and put it at the door tonight when you go to bed. In case the Lord comes, we're ready to go. No getting up packing the next day because it's that quick. That's our future. This world's not my home. We live our lives expectantly awaiting the fulfillment of God's promise. Listen, that's our hope and that's our trust. That's what helps us live and get by. It's our, these are our future tense verbs. This is something that's going to happen. My hope is in God and in heaven and all that he's prepared. And I trust in all of that. That's all future. I, I enjoy the life that God's given me at this moment, but I'm going to tell you something, it's not heaven. <laughs> I need to anticipate the promises of God. The Christian, the past is forgiven, the presence is empowered by what is to come. The career of faith has an end of a finished work, a fulfilled hope, and a realized destiny. Believe and obey is what we do between redemption and our final rest. So today, as we're going through this Thanksgiving week, so to speak, most people, you can't even tell it's Thanksgiving, it looks like Christmas. <laughs> By the time it gets Christmas time, you can't go to the store and buy any Christmas stuff. They've had it out for months. It's already gone. Every time of the year, about to get one of <laughs> The week of Thanksgiving. Pause and thank God for the past. For what He's done in the past on the cross, and what He's done in the past in your life. And then pause and say, God, I thank you for today. For life. That you're still working on me. And that I'm still listening. And I still have a desire to serve you. And it gets greater and greater. Thank you. And then Paul's to say, Lord, thank you for what you've given me. But I know there's something much greater than this. You're preparing a place just for me. That's all done. You're going to come get me. Or if my time rolls up before that's finished, you'll take me to a place of rest waiting for that to be finished. But it's all good. And I thank you because that's my hope.
Thanksgiving. Past. Present. done the children of Israel good to have looked at their past and reminded themselves of what God had brought them from and where he had brought them to. They spent too much time complaining about how we're going to eat, how we're going to drink, how we're going to get clothed. Listen, the worldly farmers know that. And your heavenly father knows all about that. Seek you first. He knows God and his righteousness. And then all those things will be added. So you don't worry about how you're going to eat. It might get slim sometimes. I've been there. Where you're going to live might not be the best place sometimes, but there's a roof over your head. It's warm. Psalm that says, Thank you for your blessings on me. I've got a roof up above me and a good place to sleep. I got food on the table and shoes on my feet. We got a lot to be thankful for, folks. There's so much greater that God wants for us. Even while we're here, let us respond to Him today and let us be thankful for our past. watching my Facebook. I'm glad that you tuned in. Appreciate you being part of the service. I hope you have a great Thanksgiving day with your family as you gather around with them. But please remember to talk about Jesus because it's all about Him. He's made in the way that you can be who you are and enjoy the time that you enjoy. I pray that you'll think about that, your past, your present, your future, and if you don't know Jesus, you'll find Him as your Savior. Thanks for watching. We'll see you, Lord willing, on Wednesday night.